Thank you, Matias, and thank you, Franco, to be here in this meeting to speak about uh, teaching and uh, school. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Andrea. So the idea is uh, to let Matias speak about these, uh, let's say, new teaching strategies that uh, he already experienced in uh, Sweden a few years ago, and to describe a bit how these uh, teaching strategies were proposed from uh, politicians or uh, other people, and uh, especially what was the results of this uh, new strategy strategy. Okay. Yeah, you call it new teaching strategy. It's not so new to us, but it might be new to you. But uh, yes, so it was already, let's say, after the Second World War, there was this idea that uh, teaching from the desk, this ex cathedra teaching, it's a bit authoritarian and it demands a lot of discipline from the students. So it was started to be seen as a bit suspicious. So there were these ideas that maybe it's better to not just try to pass on knowledge to the students, but try to educate the students, instruct the students into becoming good citizens, which in itself is, is not a bad idea. But but then it, it kind of turned into this teaching strategy where you don't put so much emphasis on the knowledge. You put more emphasis on having the children, having the students work for themselves and creating their own knowledge. And then already in the 70s, from politicians, you saw this idea that it shouldn't be so much focus on, on knowledge. But it mainly was a big change, I think, in the 90s, in the 1990s, with a new curriculum, where it was overall seen as a rather, I was seen as a suspicious idea to be this kind of old-fashioned teacher where you stand, you sit even behind the desk, and you talk to the students, you give a lecture, you pass on the knowledge. So this was seen both as outdated, outmoded, authoritarian, and also it was seen as not very efficient. So, so it was based on this constructivist idea of knowledge, that knowledge is not something you can pass on. Knowledge is something you make yourself. Knowledge is something you create. And knowledge takes place in a context, and knowledge is not just accumulated, but you build on previous knowledge. So the idea was that just giving lectures, just trying to pass on knowledge is rather pointless because the students need to learn by themselves. And this became the norm for basically everybody, for politicians, for teacher trainers, for headmasters, for, you know, anyone basically who engaged in school and pedagogy. This was the idea that this is how our teaching should be done. But, but as usual, when you have an idea, you usually take it to the extreme. So this becomes a uh, dogma and this becomes the thing that everybody has to do. So it's kind of turned into a situation where teaching from the desk, teaching ex cathedra was more or less forbidden. You know, it wasn't officially forbidden, but you were not supposed to do it. So the main focus was on the student students' own work, they should do their own projects, they should do their own research, they should focus on what they're interested in. And then the idea was that teaching will be much more interesting, it will be much more fun, and the students will learn a lot more than this by working like this. But then we have the PISA tests and all these tests which check the knowledge of students uh, all over the world. And from the early 2000s, we've seen a degradation in maths, in science, in reading ability. And of course, it's difficult to prove the causality here, to prove that this is a cause of the teaching strategies. But there is quite a clear correlation that we've seen that maybe five, ten years after this became the norm, then the results, the grades started to deteriorate. So now, of course, the pen limb swings back. So now, you know, politicians, teachers, I would say most people now in education and teaching, realize that this constructivist-based education, at least when you take it to the extreme like we did, is not such a good idea. So maybe we need to go back to a more knowledge-based education. So I would say at the universities where they train teachers, they still kind of cling on to this constructivist idea. But for teachers, for headmasters, for politicians, they have more and more turned back to the idea that we need to focus more on knowledge, focus on the teacher being in the center, focus on the teacher as clear leader in the classroom, and don't give so much power to the students as we used to. So uh, yeah, that, that's basically the, the history. Matthias, if I understood correctly, the recent history of uh, Swedish uh, school system, uh, it could be summarized in three different phases. The first one is knowledge is in the center and there is a, a ex cathedra relationship between uh, teachers and students. And the second one is uh, no more 
that, uh, let's say, uh, form of uh, teaching, but uh, the student uh, is supposed to learn by himself. So there is a kind of self-knowledge uh, idea behind uh, the second phase. And the third one, if I understood correctly, you went back a bit, but it's a more uh, a synthesis of the two previous phases. Did I understand uh, correctly? Mm, yes, yeah. Okay. That's the idea. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I have already some questions, but I would like to give the chance to Franco to say something or to ask something to Matthias about this topic. Yes, I read your paper and the statistics you provided us with about the decline of uh, knowledge for Swedish students from uh, objective tests in the first decades of this uh, century. And uh, yes, I understand where well, oh, I can figure out why the reasons why and you provided us also with the reasons the historical background so that that policy which started after the, the second world war in the 60s or 70s you said so it's a long time long time experiment isn't it <laughs> yeah, it's a long time experiment. And uh, it took a few decades from the idea started to arise until it was implemented. And then maybe another decade, two decades before you see the consequences of, of yes. what was done. So, so yes, yes also, it, it, it takes some time. Does. Yes, because there is, uh, at least I take uh, an analogy from the Italian context, there is a resistance from the teachers themselves, because the teachers were trained uh, with some ideas when they were young. And so they are not so so open, let's um, say, to the new. Not 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 open. It's not open because open is a good word in my vocabulary. They are not so weak, so weak, not open, so weak to obey like slaves to the ministry. I'm not speaking open-minded. I don't think that my colleagues are open-minded. I don't. I do not. <laughs> But there is a resistance caused by inertia, caused by previous ideologies, caused by the legacy from youth, you know. And that makes the spreading of uh, this uh, pedagogical ideology uh, a little bit slow. For instance, it is quicker in the big cities, in the metropolitan area. It's slower in the provinces. At least that happens in Italy. The worst uh, high schools where this ideology spread in Italy are in the cities, not in the towns or villages. So I can understand the sociological process of spreading. It took time to be digested by the authorities and then to be transformed or put into direction, instruction from the ministry, and then to overcome the resistance from the teachers and their previous habits, and then to spread from school to school, from the cities to the towns. It doesn't look odd to me. However, that is the development of an idea through the society, in these cases the Swedish society. There are similarities and differences in the Italian societies, but we live in this very same Western European context. We share between us Italians and you Scandinavians and the British and the French is much more than with the Russians or the Ukrainians, not to say with the Chinese, you know. So there is some cultural European and Western European, not Eastern European background, historical background or cultural background. And so... There are differences, similarities, but the similarities are many more than the differences, in my opinion, if I can compare our Italian school with your Swedish one. I would like to say something about the philosophical basis or premises of history you told us about uh, post-war Swedish school. The philosophical premises are very ancient. They belong to Socrates, you know. Maiotic. Maiotic is something which disrupts the out, out of this ideology. The ideology says out, so either out in, in, in Latin, either it is the authoritarian teachers who pours down all um, his or her stuff into uh, over the poor passive student or either or out, out in Latin, exclusive conjunction. Or it is a creative, open-minded, and independent, and young, but young not just in, for age, but in spirit, student who, in his freedom and creativity, does or makes something. 
I don't know what actually. Either or out out. Whereas the ancient uh, the ancient Socrates didn't put any out out any other or. But together the midwife and the pregnant woman. It was a metaphor from the job of his mother. The midwife, the pregnant woman, together not out out or or. Together, act being committed to different roles, but complementary roles, complementary jobs. The midwife has to pull out, to elicit, to extract something from the within, the inner part of the mind, of the knowledge, of the memory, of the intelligence of the student. The student is the pregnant woman in the Socratic metaphor, you know. So not either the ex cathedra pulling down, nor the creative creating shit from the student. No, 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 no. But together, this is an optimistic view. The Socratic view is optimistic. Why it is optimistic? It is optimistic because it has a premise that both the persons, both the subjects involved in the relationship had lived, had lived and absorbed from the society, the institutions, the language, the moral values values, the political habits, the technical and scientific devices and uh, daily way of life uh, based on technology, both persons have absorbed, not explicitly, often, for most times, but implicitly. The teacher is more conscious of it, of this process, because he's older, he's an expert, he focuses his career on this more than the student, but both subjects have absorbed the reality, reality is political institutions, moral values, technical and scientific devices, family affections, love, etc. And they are there within their inner minds. The conscious subject, the teacher, has the duty or job to extract to make explicit what implicitly is already. And if I'm finishing, <laughs> I'm too long. I've been too long. There is not any either or. That uh, unfortunate, terrible either or was put by Marxism, as for what I know of Western history of ideas. I finished. So let me summarize, uh, Frank, what you just said. That basically you are saying that uh, there are not just these two options of, of teaching, but there is a third way, a third option, which is represented by the Socratic maieutic, Socratic dialogue, which is a kind of in between the two extreme options, right? In between, but not because it's just you are bartender and you had to make a cocktail. So you put a little bit of Prosecco, a little bit of Campari, a little bit of soda. No, 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 no. That is not a matter of quantity, of mixing quantities of different items. No, 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 no. It's something qualitatively extremely different. It's the third way. No, third way means north and west, northwest. No, 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 no. It is not west in between north and west. I rule out this way you understand the thing. Because, you know, I think that everybody of us, the two of us, have experienced some teacher when we are, we are attending the middle school or the primary school or the high school or the university, some teachers who are just repeating what they are learned in the youth or also read we are reading the textbooks the manuals i think that i guess i guess that everybody of us has experienced some teachers who were as cathedral in this sense of the word. They were really pouring out of them something already prepared, like a liquid from a glass into another glass. First, I guess the three of us had experienced some teachers, perhaps three out of 20 or five out of 40, okay? Second, I guess because of our ages and because all of us live in this Western society, we have experienced also that 68 movement created of creativeness. I'm sure of us have experienced that. But both of them rule out something which is essential to knowledge. Both the ignorant and passive and disaffectionate teacher who read from the manual and the creative, proud and ignorant student who says something about, uh, I don't know, the main problems of our society. Hmm? Both of them lack the knowledge of, if we choose a discipline, biology, for instance, we could choose mathematics, we could choose physics, but if we choose biology, just to give an example, if we don't have me, 
and my students. The legacy, the legacy, the objective, real, real, because there is just one reality, not two or three or I don't know one now, maybe one reality of Aristotle, of Darwin, of Linnaeus, of Lamarck, of Jacques Monod, of Stephen Jay Gould, if we, both the teacher and the student, have not that knowledge, not just the two subjects, and both of them try, struggle to overcome the other, the teacher's cathedra or the creative student from his, I don't know, 68 mo movement uh, sitting. No, because there is a third, a more important, much more important subject, the classics. Okay, Franco, so I think it's clear, but uh, let me ask uh, Matthias, because uh, before, when he described a bit the Swedish history of the teaching system, let's say, he described three different phases. And the last one looked like uh, a third way, but I want to check with Matthias if this third way is uh, following a bit the Socratic uh, example, Socratic maieutics, like uh, Franco was uh, saying now, or is something different? Yeah, this third way is not exactly myutics. It's more a combination of these two. So the idea is then that, uh, yes, you do need some kind of knowledge basis. So uh, we don't need to completely remove the teacher from the cathedra. He, he can still give lectures. However, it's not supposed to be 100% lecture-based transferring of knowledge. So yes, you need some kind of foundation. You need some shared basis to stand on. Before you can then maybe not create your own knowledge, this is a strange idea, but to, you know, be instrumental in implementing the knowledge. So you're not just an empty receiver, you're also working on it. You're also being active in the learning process. In a way, you're an active subject in, in the process and you elaborate the knowledge. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the idea. Then, of course, myutics is fine to use as well as a method. And of course, as a philosophical practitioner, I like myutics a lot. But I don't think teaching completely can be replaced by myutics. For instance, like we heard, like Oscar said once, which I think makes sense, that you cannot recreate the entire mathematics just by using myutics. It needs to be something else, else as well. But uh, myutics, yes, I think is an excellent way of having discussions with the students, making them aware of the limits of their own knowledge, making them aware of the, the lands of their own ignorance, to make them aware of what they know and what they don't know. Also helping them becoming subjects in taking responsibility for the actual process of understanding something. So in that case, you're not just passive receiving something, you are active, you're engaged in a discussion with the teacher. So I think it's a crucial part of the teaching, not to be replaced exclusively with myutics, but using myutics as well as part of the instruction. Yes. So how would you describe your personal way to teach? Well, I try to mix. You know? I was also influenced. I've been teaching now for almost 20 years. So <laughs> let's say 10, 15 years ago, I was also influenced by these uh, trends. Mm -hmm. And I also believed that, no, it's wrong. You shouldn't, you know, give too much instruction. You shouldn't owe oh, too much passing on of knowledge. But uh, yeah, I try to mix it. I do lecture. I do use this. But I also see the importance of getting the students involved in being creative, being subjects in their own education, which doesn't mean that you should leave them to themselves. It doesn't mean that they should completely be responsible for whatever they do. The teacher is still, you know, the leader, still the boss, still gives the guidelines and maybe gives the material, yeah, preferably gives the material, gives the timeline, you know, structures the work. But within these rather well-defined structures, then you can give the students some freedom to work on their own. But then you need the yeah you need the guidance the structure from the teacher and so you you don't risk students just completely go on from whatever direction they like yeah so basically there is the lecture part in your teaching but there is also the interactive uh, myeutics part and also maybe you leave uh, sometimes uh, some freedom to your student but uh, with some instructions in order to guide them uh, and uh, to use this freedom to learn actually something yeah and the instruction the guidance is important because when you leave someone to do whatever they like they will most likely do something they already know <laughs> if you tell a student now you can do whatever whatever you like for the next three weeks, he will do something he already did because it's easy or he will yeah, do something he already knows because then he's comfortable in... They wouldn't doing. challenge themselves, basically. No, no, because if you challenge yourself, if you do something you don't know, there's a risk that you will fail. So if you want students to challenge themselves 
put it, be challenged. You need to push them out of their comfort zone because they're not going to go out of their comfort zone on their own. They might look like they're, oh my, they might be working very well and they could be, you know, creative, whatever, but most likely they'd be working on something they're already comfortable with. Yeah, yeah. So not, not, not much teaching probably is going to take place. Okay. And let me ask uh, Franco the same question I asked to you, Matthias. How would you describe your way to teach uh, Franco? I teach two subjects, history of philosophy and political history. In both subjects, there is, yes, there is a, a sad uh, difference between my ideals and my practice. Sadly, I have to admit it. However, my ideals are to present the legacy from the past, of the political institutions, political deeds, or the heroes or leaders of the political history of the past, or the ideas, the systems, philosophical systems from the philosophers of the past. My ideal is to present that legacy legacy to us, to me and to the students together in order to solve, to understand better. Yes, to solve is quite strong as an expression, isn't it? But uh, let us say in a weaker say, in a weaker meaning of it, to understand better a problem, an issue of today, of now. For instance, I give an example, if not I'm too cryptic and enigmatic, isn't it? For instance, there is a government in Italy nowadays, uh, the Meloni government. And the Meloni government wants, among many other things, put into the school system the so-called moral education about uh, feelings, affections, affections and feelings. This is an issue today, because today many of us, or some of us, disagree with the government. So far, till we are allowed to disagree with the government which is not guaranteed at all, especially now and in Italy. However, as far as we are still allowed to disagree with the government, some of us disagree from the idea that we have to give moral education about feelings and sentiments to or affections or affective relationships to the students. Because some of us are tied with belong to the liberal ideals that the state and the school must not interfere with that matter. The ethical state is a huge, terrible, tragic mistake, the ethical state. The state which pretends to give moral education. Some of us, perhaps not the majority, but some of us disagree with the, this policy of the government. So now I go back to my way of teaching and to answer the question given to me by Andrea. I read a text written in February 1925 by Benedetto Croce. Benedetto Croce was both an important philosopher and the most important antifascist person in Italy during the 20 years of the government of Mussolini. Benedetto Croce. If Winston Churchill or Charles de Gaulle or Franklin Delano Roosevelt knew any name of one antifascist in Italy, the name was that of Benedetto Croce. And Benito Croce, in that February of 1925, wrote a manifesto, the manifesto of antifascist intellectuals. And hundreds of scientists, artists, writers, uh, novelists, uh, and scientists uh, signed at the bottom that manifesto written by Croce. Hundreds. In that manifesto, the main point is, we disagree with Mussolini and his, we disagree, because Mussolini said that fascism, the fascist party, is a new religion for the Italian people, because the Italian people was dried up by atheism, enlightenment, and the industrial society do not have the Italian people any uh, moral value. And so we fascists provided them not just with the government and ministries and ministers and police uh, and taxation, no, but also with a new religion. And Croce said, a political party, according to our liberal ideals, which were born in the 18th century, but developed in the 19th century with, uh, you know, Benjamin Constant, Alexis de Tocqueville, George Stuart Mill, and then Karl Popper, and blah, 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 blah. Our liberal ideals, our liberal ideals are very different from yours. A political party must not interfere with religion, is not a religion. So, and now I'm finishing, Andrea. 
I present that text, il manifesto degli intellettuali antifascisti del 1925, scritto da Benedetto Croce e sottoscritto by hundreds of Italian intellectuals, in order to solve, to understand better what is happening now in Italy, at, in the Italian school. And I hope, somehow, to some extent, that my students can understand, because they are coming to school every day, every day. And so the, the next week they have to attend a class about education to affective relationships. What is the value of the manifesto written in 1925? There is just one value, to put light on a problem, an issue of today, I think. Okay, so by answering my question, Franco, I think you brought up a very important issue and topic, which is the idea of education, and especially, I would say, the relation between the idea of education and the idea of teaching, yeah? So now about this topic, I would like to ask uh, Matthias, uh, since uh, if I remember correctly, when you describe the history of the Swedish teaching, you distinguish uh, education from teaching knowledge, let's say. Yeah? So in a way, education, it seems to be something different, something more or something less, I don't know. So what do you think about this relation between these two phenomenon, education on one side and teaching on the other one? Yeah, okay. So the way I use the term here and... Yeah, in yeah, I... sorry, sorry. Sorry, Matthias, just a second. I have to give a, a technical advice to Andrea. In the English language, education means teaching knowledge. There is not a ministry of instruction. There is a ministry of education. Education means what we call in Italian and Italian language, istruzione. Whereas, what is the English word? Anglophone, American, New Zealand, Australian word for educare is to bring out parents bring out their children or they raise their children. They give so the basic moral values of human life. The parents raise their children or they bring out their children. Not they educate their children because for the education they have to um, send them to school. Yeah, it's true what you are saying, Franco. At the same time, when uh, Matthias was uh, explaining the history of Swedish teaching, I think he, he was saying that at one point there was a big turn between the idea of just uh, transferring knowledge and, uh, let's say, create a condition in order to make uh, children or students grow up as a good citizen. So I think uh, in that uh, turn, there is uh, two different idea between knowledge and education. So that's why my question. So, yes. yes. Yeah. 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 There is a different idea. So yeah, maybe these terms are not so so, so clear cut. So so clear here, uh, teaching and education. So never mind the terms, but but the idea, the difference in the idea is that uh, what I call teaching would be the ex cathedra, the passing on of knowledge, where you have the idea that okay, this is the knowledge which everyone should have this is the knowledge that we should transfer to the school children because this is what they need to know in order to be yeah well knowledgeable people whatever the knowledge they know to be to be able to get a job to go to university and so on but then the other idea which became prominent was here i call it education but you can see it more as uh, raising people bringing up people more like what parents are doing where you are transforming children from being children to becoming adults so it's not just passing on knowledge but you teach them how to behave like people you teach them how to treat each other you teach them how to be good democratic citizens in a way uh, but yes we can call it moral teaching we can call it moral yeah Yes, but it's a little bit broader than just moral teaching, I think. But 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 yes, something like that. Okay, okay. So then it turned more to this kind of moral teaching, where it was seen as much more important to teach them how to be uh, good people and also giving them the skills to teach themselves. So that was also an important idea. Rather than me teaching the students, I should teach the students how they can teach themselves. That was also a very popular idea, let's say 10, 15 years ago, that the world is changing so quickly. So if I teach them something now, five years from now, it's going to be outdated. So it's, it's better if I can teach them how to teach themselves. Then they can teach themselves whatever they need to know. That's also a popular part of this. Yeah, but the risk of moral education, not the kind of moral education we are speaking about, don't you think is uh, the chance to turn easily in an indoctrination? Yeah, yeah of course. So it's you're much more likely to fall for a certain ideology when you focus on moral education. Yeah, yeah. Of course, because it's not it's no longer so much facts based. No, it's ideology based. 
So, so yes, there's always the risk that, that you will switch depending on what part is in power or depending on the trends in society at the moment. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let me ask a, a, a last question I want to speak about. It's about the issue of power, because uh, at the beginning of your initial the, the description, you said that uh, in a way that turned to this more modern uh, way of teacher, which is not modern anymore in Sweden, but in Italy, yes, is uh, the idea of uh, teaching ex cathedra was perceived as something authoritarian. Yeah. And when you said authoritarian, I connect that idea to power idea. Yeah. So I thought that there is a problem, an issue with the power. Do you see this issue with power in the school system, in the Swedish one or no? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yes, there is this issue. So it, it has power and authority has uh, negative connotations here. So the ideal was that the teacher should be more a guide, someone who guides the students. A facilitator. Uh, facilitator, yes rather than telling them what to do. So there are these uh, horror images, sadistic teachers shouting at students, hitting the students, forcing the students to learn some, you know, nonsense, whatever it is that they have no, no, no use for. So it was a way of trying to get away from this and to have a more softer approach where the teacher is more a collaborator and the teacher and the student, they work together to explore whatever it is and, and they gain knowledge by investigating something as more as a team than as a boss and his employees, a teacher and his students. So indeed, it, it is this power issue. My hypothesis is that maybe this uh, new trend of teaching took over, not because they were real efficient in the teaching, but because there was this issue with the power. Yeah, that's an important part of it. Mm, okay. It is, yeah. So it's a kind of reaction from a power system or authoritarian system. Yeah, it is. And now we have another reaction where we want to, or, or lots of people want to have the power back, give back the power. That's popular now. <laughs> give back the power to the teacher. <laughs> teacher has to be powerful. Yeah. Because the, the teachers have been seen as, like uh, Franco said, they have been seen as weak. And the students take over. So now we need to give the power back to the teacher. That's uh, the okay. buzzword today. Yeah, in Italy, I don't think we are already in that uh, phase. We are still in the, in the second one, let's say. But Franco, what do you think about this power issue from your experience? Experience. From my experience, because I'm 64, so I was nine in uh, 1968, which was a crucial year for cultural and political history of Italy. So throughout all my life, I suffered from experiences. Also, I made reflections about them. I read books, blah, 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 blah. And my answer to your question is that in the 60s, there were not authoritarian teachers. Oh, there were a few, a little minority, like there are among judges, among policemen, among doctors, you know. But there was not a widespread attitude of authoritarian desires or practices. No, that is not what I think. I think that uh, that was a propaganda, the mottos of propaganda, from the 1968 activists, movement activists. They said and pretended that there was a sadistic, uh, capitalistic, uh, bourgeois, bourgeoisie who wanted to suppress the workers in the factories and the students at school. And so they were the saviors who could give freedom to both the workers in the factories and the students in the, at school or the universities. But in reality, what I think is that they didn't want to do that. That was just a Machiavellian propaganda in order to get power for themselves. And by the way, it's a singular coincidence that in Sweden, this turn of the teaching system was uh, around the 70s. And now, uh, Franco, you are describing this uh, important, uh, let's say, switch in the Italian culture around the 68, right? I don't know if in Sweden you had something like that, some movement like that, some propaganda like that as well, uh, Matthias. Mm, yeah, 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 it's similar. Yeah. It's around the same time, yes. Oh, okay. So maybe we being slower in order to put that in uh, the concrete experience. Uh, maybe we, we resist more uh, as an institution, as schools or teachers uh, than a Swedish one. Yeah, we, we like to try new things. 
<laughs> so we always want to be first with everything. So also because they are in in Sweden, uh, the neo Marxist activists could not aim the Swedish government, the Swedish institutions, because they had been social democrat for decades, even before the Second World War. It was very different from the Italian political situation mm -hmm. because social democracy was based in Germany before the First Second World War and the Scandinavian countries. So the 1968 uh, movement activists could not say you are fascist because they were the ministers, the government, the journalists, the teachers were mostly social democrats. Mm -hmm. So inspired themselves by Marxism, but another kind of Marxism, not the neo-Marxism of the 1968 movement, but the Marxism of the 19th century. Okay, maybe that explains the difference between the... Yeah, yeah. Is a hint, a suggestion, I give it to you. But I, I want to say to Matthias, there is a book, now I can write it uh, using the chat. In the chat, I write the, the crucial text of this pedagogy in Italy, of this kind of pedagogy, without uh, any respect for knowledge, for the classics, any respect for that. There is a crucial text, to so the starting point. It was written in 1966, but published in 1968. Okay, it's Lettera a una professoressa, which means letter to a teacher. Yeah. And that is a, the very influential, super influential starting point. The starting point, in my opinion, in my experience of my life, because I've been a teacher for 40 years, is that that propaganda anti-authoritarian propaganda produced eventually a, a school much, much more authoritarian than the school <laughs> I experienced before. It looks like uh, there is something that's bothering you about this issue. <laughs> Don Milani, a 1968 movement? Yes, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and by the way, Matthias, you know some popular pedagogists, Swedish uh, pedagogists uh, nowadays, uh, that they are influencers in a way, the, the teaching, or no? Mm, not really. Yeah, well, maybe. Well, I think this is his name. Uh, Jonas Linderoth? Yeah. So he wrote a famous article a few years ago where he apologized because he was one of the teachers who promoted this new style of not teaching from the desk. And he, he gave lectures and he traveled all around the country and uh, instructed teachers and talked to teachers about how they should give up the old ways of uh, teaching ex cathedra. Now he's changed his mind. So yeah, telling... he admitted that he was wrong. Yeah, and now he's telling everyone I was wrong. So don't <laughs> listen to what I said 10 years ago. Now I was completely wrong now i changed my mind okay interesting so maybe franco we could uh, have a look about that book i think it's interesting even for the italian uh, teaching experience but sadly don lorenzo milani suffered from cancer and died when he was still in his 40s so he cannot repent <laughs> let alone from purgatory okay okay mm. or hell <laughs> but they say that people in hell they cannot repent Okay, so I'm done with the question, but if you want to add something or if you want to propose any conclusion after the discussion, you are free to do it. Well, I can just add, because Franco said that the 68 movement in Sweden, they could not attack the, the government because they were social democrats, but they did, because they were so left. So social democrats were fascists in their eyes. So even the social democrat was bourgeoisie, it was fascist, it was right wing, according to their standards. So what they mainly reacted against, I think, was the, the older generations. With the older generations, they identified basically everything that had to do with uh, structure, with order, with obeying the law, with doing things in an ordered manner. So the new ideal was to be free, to open the doors and but let children do whatever they wanted to do and uh, focus on art, focus on music, not formal teaching. In a way, they were trying to destroy the tradition, to attack in the tradition more. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. You would like uh, to write uh, a sentence which summarizes my ideal of school. Ah, oh, okay. You can read it if you want now. Yes. William Salisbury wrote in the 12th century, I remember of my dear mentor, the late Bertrand of Chartres, and he used to say that we are just doves on the shoulders of giants. I think that sentence uh, invented by Bertrand de Chartres but given to us, uh, handed down to us by William of Salisbury, summarizes something which is not the legacy of Romanticism, the creativeness of genius. 
So creative in this of genius. They're just dwarfs on the shoulders of giants. And it's interesting this uh, quote, uh, Franco, because uh, if you want to link this quote to the, the discussion we just had, uh, we could say that at one point, both in Sweden and in Italy, we thought we could uh, get rid of uh, giants. So we remain just dwarf without just any dwarf. giant Just dwarfs. Just dwarfs lost in darkness. Yeah, and at least in the Swedish experience, that's what uh, happened. So they decide to go back in order to climb on the giant climb. Yes, but that is that is a difference between their and our societies. Because, Andrea, you are much younger than me, but despite that, throughout your life, have you ever heard of any Italian intellectual, say Massimo Cacciari or Lucio Colletti, Gianni Vattimo, or the journalists, I don't know, Michele Serra? who were followers of Mao Zedong during their youth, staying now when they are in their 70s. Oh, I repent. Oh, I was wrong to follow Mao Zedong. I was wrong to shake his red little leaflet. Mao Zedong, Mao I was wrong. Now I repent. I made a mistake. Now I want to apologize. Have you ever heard of any? Have you ever heard? No, I haven't. During your life. So I, I think that Jonas Linderoff is... A sample of a different attitude we don't have in Italy. Sadly. Okay, so basically we don't admit our mistakes. That's the idea. Yes. Yeah. Think about the, the mother of all these lies. When we were freed into inverted commas, big inverted commas, by the Anglo-Americans in 1945, we said that we freed ourselves. We heroic partisans, we heroic partisans, we heroic partisans. Not the B-44 of the Americans, not the Sherman tanks or Churchill tanks of, of the English. No, no. We, we were not fascist. So we never apologized of for our fascism because we pretended from the very beginning, 1945, that we were not fascists. The fascists came from Mars, another planet in the outer space. Yeah, in a way, Italian culture and responsibility, they don't go very well together. They don't get along, yeah. So I think uh, we discussed uh, enough. It was interesting, the discussion. So I thank you both. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Franco. Thank you. Yes, Matthias, thank you for your contribution. I will send you, if you like, through Andrea, a paper I wrote and published about the 1968 movement in Italy. Okay, yes. Yes, please do. Okay, so yeah. see you. Thank you. See you. Bye.